Hi guys, how is it going? I'm Mariana and finally I'm out of the house and back at the bookstore. In this video I want to talk about a book titled Albert Kahn's Industrial Architecture Form Follows Performance. It was edited by Thorsten Burchlin and Jürgen Reichardt and published by Berghäuser and is intended as a celebration of Albert Kahn's work on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of his birth. The book is structured around four essays, Construction by Jürgen Reichardt, Nothingness by Thorsten Burchlin, Transfer by Rudolf Fischer and After by Claire Zimmermann. We also see photographs, drawings and models of eight buildings selected by the editors and considered representative of uh, Kahn Associates' very vast production. Reichardt goes back to the beginning. Between 1905 and 1913, Kahn Associates built multi-story buildings using reinforced concrete construction for columns and floor slabs. The advantages of fire resistance and increased load-bearing capacity of the floor slabs were very attractive, particularly to investors in the automotive industry around Detroit. From 1913, however, after several years of car production, the disadvantages of multi-story factories became obvious, particularly after the introduction of conveyor belts by Henry Ford. It became clear that single-story buildings with large open spans were far more advantageous for the production processes involved, as they made it possible to extend the layout of the building without limitation with respect to the depth, length and height available for production. In 1914, Khan Associates abandoned the multi-story type in favor of single-story buildings in steel and glass. Available technologies were optimized for quick installation, particularly with respect to logistics and assembly. The use of natural light and ventilation was extensive. In Highland Park, Henry Ford had already discovered that the provision of generous daylight led to a reduction in error rates and that it was possible to achieve greater space efficiency because the production machinery could be placed closer together. Kahn experimented with glare-free shed roofs, Mansell silhouettes, offset monopitch roofs in a butterfly shape, and monitor roofs. These systems were considered exemplary in terms of the quality and evenness of the lighting. However, Reichardt also points out that from the beginning of the 1940s, generous horizontal and vertical glazing was increasingly avoided because of a worry over nighttime air raids by Japanese and German bombers. This trend eventually prevailed, in particular in America in the post-war era, supported by the supposedly better cost efficiency of hermetically sealed buildings that were lit by strip lights throughout the day and night. In his contribution to the volume, Thorsten Burchlin points out that the sites Kahn was given for the design of his factory buildings were greenfield sites, a kind of tabula rasa. On these large sites, the only determining parameters for design and construction resulted from any existing infrastructure, from production sequences, from the materials used, and, of course, from commercial viability. He also remarks that though these buildings were reduced to the bare necessities, they do not lack ideological context. This was the beginning of the 20th century, and in the fluctuating world of capital, they were the symbols of technology and rationality, of entrepreneurial energy and commercial vitality. As Claire Zimmerman points out, Albert Kahn was both famous and wealthy when he died in 1942. But after his death, his reputation gradually changed. By 1958, his work was barely mentioned in the histories of modern architecture. Only more recently, his work has been re-evaluated as central to the techno-utopian project of modernism. According to Zimmerman, the perception that buildings should respond to rapid technological change and that economies of scale demand different manners of design and execution echoes with today's rapidly changing technology environment, suggesting that we look to Albert Kahn's associates and similar offices challenged by rapid change in the early part of the 20th century. The book ends with current photographs of Albert Kahn's industrial buildings. In these very striking images, we see how they were subject to extensive modifications or were left to gradually deteriorate.
The current photos of the seamless steel company factory are, in my opinion, the most interesting. The metal sheets cladding the older daylight factory make it almost indistinguishable from newer warehouses or big box retail outlets. This single alteration had such a lasting impact on the built environment of the United States. I really enjoyed the content of this book and I hope you will do as well. Check it out at your local bookstore. Thank you very much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.